Some artists spend their lives leaping from subject to subject, theme to theme, exploring for a moment, finding inspiration, and then moving to the next one for the next inspiring moment. But for many artists, a theme can run throughout all of their work, and they explore that theme to its full depth. Ted Coney is one such artist who has developed all his work totally around one theme, his family. Um, I suppose as a child I've always drawn and made up stories in my head as I was drawing. Um, and uh, it was when I started teaching um, that I knew I wanted to carry on painting, but it was what was I going to do? What, what, where did you go to art school? Um, I went to um, a place called Bath Academy of the Art. Uh, the name appealed to me. Um, and uh, it was very well known for training art teachers, but also allowed you to do your own practice as well. Um, as I say, I wanted a really strong theme. Um, otherwise, it didn't seem, didn't seem to be any point. If it was mainly 2D, I, I, I've never done anything like sculpture. It was painting and printmaking. Mm. Um, and uh, I even did a, a short course in shadow puppets, which is interesting, um, seeing as my latest painting. Mm -hmm. I had to make shadow puppets to work from. Um, but as I said, my first family painting, which I thought would be my last, was um, in 1969. And it was after the death of my grandmother and her four sisters. It had all been very formidable, but really nice women. Um, and it was only after they'd gone that I realised how much I missed them because they'd been very much part of my childhood. And so to hang on to them, um, I produced this painting called Life Cycle. Um, I guess it was a bit like the... Um, the cavemen, you know, they'd made drawings of the animals they wanted control over. For me, I wanted something to keep keep the, 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 the great ants alive. I think the thing is, once I'd started, I realised that there were so many ideas that, uh, you know, I didn't consciously think, oh, I will now paint the family for the rest of my life. But here I am at 72, you know, um, several decades later, still, still, still painting them. But it wasn't a conscious decision to start with. And obviously the way I paint has, has, has probably changed. I don't paint people anymore. Um, I guess I'm more painting ideas um, rather than people. But they're always sparked off by family. I, I had an old guy at um, University of the Third Age lecture a few months ago. And he came up at the end and he said, you know, I thought to begin with you were talking about your family. He said, but by the end you were talking about mine. And I think it's this thing that everybody's got a family, whether they like them or not. Um, and uh, things that have happened to my family have happened to everybody else's. Usually I have three paintings on the go. One is actually on the easel that I'm working on, which at the moment is Bicycle Thieves. Um, one is in my head, but I've already started a kind of, I, I actually have folders and I put things in the folders. So it kind of is beginning to be, a little, take a bit more of a form. So um, uh, uh, something's coming out of my re our recent visit to visit our middle son, Leo, in New Zealand. Um, and... Um, I was very interested in the Maori meeting houses, which actually symbolise, as I understand it, the actual bones of the ancestors. And so I said for Christmas, he sent me a book on Maori meeting houses at my request. But I also, when I was there, I found myself drawing in a museum uh, an eel trap. And of course, we have eels in Ely. And this idea that you go down the eel goes down and gets caught and, you know, can't get out again. And I guess I'm kind of thinking in a way that Leo's gone, um, you know, down to New Zealand or up or wherever they are. Um, and although it, it's brilliant, he's doing really well and he's really happy there. There is a sadness um, because, uh, you know, 
he makes me laugh and I like to see him every day. This is Eve's bedroom, which is now Max's room. This is our yellow bathroom. <laughs> this is my room, but it isn't orange anymore. This is our kitchen, which has been refurnished. I don't consciously set out to make a nice picture. I don't think in those terms. I, I've got this idea in my head and I've had it for maybe two years before I actually start doing it because the paintings have to queue up and wait their, wait their turn to be painted. I guess as a child I was always interested in puppets um, and they were a way of me telling stories through, you know, I didn't do puppet shows to people uh, and in fact I'm, I'm probably a terrible puppeteer um, but I guess as a very young child I used puppets um, but then, and then of course later with my, my own family of, you know, Hazel and the three children, um, we, we uh, uh, because I'd done some puppetry in school with children, uh, I had this puppet theatre and we ended up making, uh, doing puppet shows every Christmas, uh, boring all our relations I expect, but it got more and more elaborate every year. So there was that kind of um, tradition in the family mm. of doing puppet shows. We have done Christmas shows which have included Phantom of the Opera and The Wizard of Oz. Now, as the audience take their seats, get ready for a spectacular extravaganza. Every so often um, I've used puppets um, because I say I don't paint people anymore. I, I tend to paint objects, but sometimes the objects are puppets because they can have a kind of power of their own. Sometimes if they're a bit like when I used Muffin the Mule and his friends, I was also interested in the symbolism of animals. So there was a kind of double layer. It wasn't just the puppet, it was the, it was the symbolism of what that animal represented and linking that to a member of the family. Um, but funny enough, I've gone back to puppets in my latest painting, Against the Light, um, where I've taken the tradition of um, Javanese shadow puppets and this idea that you, um, the women see the shadows in a, in a proper production. The women see the shadows and the men sit the other side and see the real puppets. So it's like this idea of seeing the same image um, in different ways. My mother had two um, male cousins um, who uh, their mother saw as wonderful boys and their father saw as kind of ne'er-do-wells. So um, I like this idea that you would see the, the shadows and the real puppets to represent those two sides. Um, but then, bizarrely, because I had made shadow puppets years and years ago, um, I ended up um, representing my two cousins um, as uh, Laurel and Hardy um, partly because they're the same era 1930s but also of course they're, they're brilliant um, shadows because there's one's a fat one and one's a thin one uh, they make they're very good silhouettes 
Have you ever started a painting thinking you were going to have one outcome and then ended up with something completely different? Yes, I mean I'm I'm very I'm very planned and controlled. I mean I do experiment with things and try things out, but um, th um, there's a painting um, that I did when my mother decided that she um, wanted to go into residential accommodation. She didn't want to live on her own anymore. And she summoned her three sons um, to go and choose um, uh, things out of the house because she wanted to sell the house. But she wanted to do it in a proper way. So we didn't have, we wouldn't have argued anyway, I'm sure, but um, she wanted to be there. And uh, we actually did go out for a meal beforehand. And the painting is, is, of, is, is, is really the meal. Um, but on the plates, rather than food, are the objects. Uh, not necessarily the very objects that we chose, but the idea of objects, the idea of possessions. Except that my eldest brother kept refusing and wouldn't in, enter into it, said he didn't want anything. Um, it's called the painting is called in three R Kingdom. This idea of dividing the goods into three, um, but he he uh, he didn't need any objects. They didn't need any possessions, although because although we didn't know it at the time. He died about six months later uh, of an illness that you know we didn't know about at the time of the of the meal. So the painting changed, uh, and in fact, there's an extra canvas uh, in the painting. And he, the only thing he would take, um, which is in the painting, is was was the boat that he and my father built to go sailing in, and so that's symbolised by a little boat just floating in the glass. Um, but uh, in the painting, in the bottom painting, um, what you're seeing is the view of the the table, but from eye level. And when you see it, the the same paint, the same view uh, of the of the of the meal from eye level, um, it looks as if the boat is is sailing across, which is symbolising the idea of you know the boat going to, into another life. Um, uh, so it's this idea that you see we see things from one angle and we think we know what it's about and then we from a different angle mm. it looks very different paintings about the birth of our three children um, because it you know they're such fantastic miracles when it happens um, but then I also we had our second daughter was stillborn and obviously that was devastating for uh, for uh, Hazel and I um, and I, I did a painting about that it's a very abstract painting it's called for you in loving memory and what it is it is nine circles of the spectrum of colors going into um, a white uh, which is very still and all the uh, the nine so the, the eight circles are very vibrant to represent the movement um, of, of the baby have you ever regretted starting painting no well, that's good. No, never. Um, I mean, obviously, I can look back and think, oh, well, you know, that's, that, that one wasn't so good, um, even though at the time I felt it was. Um, but I think because of the way I work, you know, this three-year process, um, that uh, hopefully by the time I started, I feel it's clicked into place. Um, I mean, obviously, sometimes something isn't working, and then I'll... You know, I'll try scrub it out and try it again in a different way. Uh, this is why I have lots of little canvases, and um, where I'm try testing things out.
and sometimes I might do a test in the middle of a painting because I think I'm not sure how it's going to work so I'll go back to that um, but no I, I, um, I mean maybe I should do sometimes but I don't <laughs> The car, yeah. Well, I've had um, I've had a Morris Minor um, of different sorts ever since I started um, learning to drive at uh, you know seventeen, um, and the present one, I guess I've had for um, let me see uh, about fifty years, and in fact for um, about thirty years it was our only car. Um, so we would stuff the three children in the back and Hazel and I in the front. We often went to places by train, I have to say, um, but it was our only car for a long time. Um, and uh, I've used it every decade. I've done a painting about it every decade since it was 50, and it's now, you know, it's in its 80s. Have any of the family ever objected to the you know, your ideas? Uh, I think they're past that. Um, well, I think now that because the ideas are slightly more um, universal, you know, I kind of feel although I'm using my family, um, there's uh, um, it could be about anybody's family. So, 2016. What are you working on at the moment? Okay, um, it's a painting about marriage uh, and not being married. Um, it's uh, really it started off with an idea about my um, my mother and two of her cousins, who this is in the nineteen thirties, all had to get married because they were pregnant, um, and I guess I'm kind of asking the question. Um, would they have got married if they hadn't been pregnant? Because obviously the, the convention of the day in respectable middle-class families was that you had to be married. Um, I think they all had reasonably happy marriages, um, but, um, you know, it's, it's life. Um, but I'm, I'm contrasting that with um, three um, newer members of the family um, who, you know, live with partners uh, but aren't married, um, starting with my uh, brother's first partner in the 1960s, when we actually called it living in sin. <laughs> um, but and I remember, in fact, when they were they were in Cornwall, she pretended that she was married because she knew that it was such a narrow, um, you know, that, that they were they were much more respectable down there in a Cornish village. She couldn't dare not to be Mrs. Coney. Um, then, um, the, I say the painting is called Bicycle Thieves because I then saw a wonderful, now was it, I think it was a Polish film, yes, of, of um, just after the war. And the story was about somebody losing his bicycle. But, um, and that was terrible because he, his job depended on it. But really that was just a symbol for the whole of the Polish nation, um, really having everything taken away from them. Uh, because of the second, what happened in the Second World War. Um, so I had this sort of idea that maybe the bicycle could represent um, what they might, what might have been, you know, maybe the loss um, to both sets of women. Uh, so um, I, in fact, I had a, um, I commissioned a wedding cake um, for the three brides. The women are actually on on, on uh, pedestals. Not quite sure whether that works or not. Um, but this idea that these these figures, because they're sporty, look a lot freer than the, the, the brides who are cl clutching the, um, uh, the bouquets to their bosoms, respectively. Um, and I've had my bicycle now for um, about uh, 50 years. Um, and in fact, bizarrely, it was stolen um, about uh, 15 years ago in Cambridge. Um, but I managed to get it back which was wonderful. And so I've been making studies of my bicycle, um, not, not because I wanted to be a whole bicycle in the painting, but I was looking for bicycle nests, if you can understand. It was just sort of shapes. 
Um, but maybe the spokes of the bicycle kind of might, I don't know, it's not finished yet, might sort of suggest this restrictiveness that all the women might feel. But it's evolving. Mm. It's evolving. It may change. The, the, the digital age that we're now in, do you think that's enhancing family portrait culture or, or, or not? I mean, everyone's got smartphones. Everyone can just snap away. Um, I think what worries me, you know, like as you mentioned, we've got quite a lot of photographs um, from past times. Um, I think what worries me in the future is because people, you know, are snapping all the time, but they're on cameras, and the the, the danger is they're gonna they're gonna end up with very few, um, because I think this idea of having an album and looking through it or having pictures on the wall, you know, I think. Um, we're not going to have as many of those in the future. And in fact, it's interesting, I've even noticed photographs that we've got up from the 1960s or 70s, you know, the, the, the color, some of the colour photographs are more faded than some of the earlier ones, you know, they're, they're just not as strong, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so... Um, you haven't got into the selfie culture? I certainly haven't, no, no, <laughs> absolutely not, no. Um... One of the students, she was very shy actually about it, and she asked me through another teacher, she wanted to do this study of old age. And she said, could she, because they're all foreign students, so they haven't got any family here, could she take a series of photographs of me? Um, but she was slightly embarrassed because it, she, <laughs> she was, she was uh, you know, saying, well, you know, you look old enough. Um, I want to. But the, the photographs are absolutely fantastic because the way she's caught the lights, I look about 120. They're amazing. Um, luckily, I'm not. You know, I don't mind. I just think they're brilliant photographs. But I don't show them to anybody in my family because they'll think, well, he's going to die tomorrow. You know, caught every crease and every line mm. in a fantastic way.